This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning to all of you and welcome to this recorded worship service on behalf of Bethel United Reformed Church in Elmer. And although this situation is unique and different because of the coronavirus and COVID-19 and the fact that we're not able to publicly meet together, we are thankful that we can meet together spiritually as we unite our hearts and our minds in worship to our great God. And so may the Lord be praised as we come before him in our households this morning. We will begin by singing a pre-service song. This is from the blue Psalter hymnal number 224, Praise God, ye servants of the Lord. We'll sing all five stanzas of Praise God, ye servants of the Lord. Let us now come before our God in a prayer of preparation, a silent prayer. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 100. Psalm 100, it is a song of praise for the Lord's faithfulness to his people. Psalm 100 says this, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Congregation, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Let's pray. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time, this morning, on your day. and We pray that you would bless us with your grace, mercy, and peace as we worship you, Almighty God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 
Our opening hymn of adoration is number 380 from the Trinity Psalter Hymnal, number 380. We will sing all the stanzas, crown him with many crowns. All the stanzas of number 380, crown him with many crowns. Call the Confession is from Psalm 40, verses 11 to 13. The psalmist says, As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Here in Psalm 40, the psalmist is acknowledging how his own sin has overwhelmed him. He says, my iniquities have overtaken me. As I think about how many sins I commit, they're more than the hairs of our head. That's a lot of sinning. And one of the reasons that we read God's law each and every Sunday is to remind us of our own sin. As we hear God's word, uh, his Ten Commandments, uh, and as we compare ourselves to this standard, we realize that we have not kept it. We have fallen short of God's holiness and glory. We are zero for 10. Now, we need to understand that this should not leave us in despair. 
our God is a holy God, but he's a merciful God. And he calls us to look away from ourselves and our sin, to look at Jesus, our wonderful Savior. So in that way, the law points us to the gospel as our only hope for salvation. So let us now hear from God's law from Exodus, actually Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. The Lord says, I'm the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the Father upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor your cattle, nor, it, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long, that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave us a summary of this law. He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And the second great command is likened to the first, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Dear people of God, let us come before our God in a song of confession, of contriteness and of humility, but also a song of a reminder of God's love and of, of his mercy and faithfulness. This is a setting of Isaiah 40, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, from the Trinity Psalter hymnal number 298. We'll sing all the stanzas of number 298, Comfort, Comfort ye my people.
Assurance of pardon is from Psalm 40, the first part of Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see and fear, and will trust in the Lord. With that word of pardon, let's now come before our God in our morning congregational pastoral prayer. Let's pray. O Lord and our God, we come into your presence this Lord's Day, your day, in a, yes, a different way, but yes, we are still in your presence, and we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we thank you for the fact that you are the God of truth. We're grateful that you are the God of grace and of glory. And we are thankful that you are the one who gives the riches of the gospel. We bless you for your steadfast, for your loyal love. We find our confidence in your character, that you are kind and gentle, and that you are a patient God. We're thankful that you are so long-suffering toward us and with us. And we remind us, remind ourselves from your word that it is your kindness that leads us to repentance. We know that you are a merciful Father. And so, as we have examined our own hearts and lives, our own thoughts and imaginations, our own motivations, we repent of our sin. We acknowledge them, we label them, and we seek to flee from them. We acknowledge how we struggle with unbelief and doubt. We struggle with fear, unfounded anxieties, that we can struggle with hearts that are full of anger and bitterness. We must say it is true of ourselves that we become very consumed and concerned about ourselves rather than being seeking to make you the center of our lives and of our existence, that we loved ourselves more than we have loved others. And so, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would purify and that you would cleanse us. We ask that you would create in us a clean heart, that you would renew a, a new spirit within us. We thank you that we can come before you in prayer. We are grateful that you are the all-knowing God, that you know the details of our broken stories, of our aching and breaking hearts. And we pray that we would listen to your voice, the voice of the Good Shepherd. And we pray that you would hear the prayers that we offer unto you in faith for our church family. We pray for those who are isolated at this time because of this sickness and also who continue to be shut into their homes. We pray that you would give them grace and strength. Lord, we ask that you would be near unto them, that although they might be alone in their home, that they can know that you are with them and that God's people are praying for them and are with them. We are humbled by the situation of COVID-19 and how it's been affecting uh, the countries of this world, how it's affected us here in our own community in Malahide and Elgin. We are humbled by the fact that we are not in control. And much has changed in the last couple of weeks. You know that, Lord, much has needed to change in our own lives. And we realize that many in our congregation have been put into situations they did not expect to be put in. And so we pray for them. We pray for those that are facing financial stresses and challenges, for those that are in situations of leadership. We particularly remember those that employ others, that have employees and are, need to make difficult decisions, have to keep their businesses operating with the limitations imposed upon our society right now. Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, those, our children, as they are unable to go to school. We pray that you would be with them, that you would help them to keep learning, to keep studying. We pray that you would help us to use this time redemptively, to not waste this time, but that you would draw our hearts nearer to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for watching over our sister Lily. Lord, we thank you for her new place at Bonnie Place and for the fact that there are many activities that she is able to do. We are grateful for the blessing that she has experienced there and we pray that you would be near to her in this time of, of, of isolation. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Bert and Mary Veenstra look forward to celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary this coming Friday. 
We thank you for them and for your faithfulness to them and their faithfulness to each other. And we pray that you would be near unto them in this uh, challenging time for them as, as Bert is at Elgin Manor and as Mary is uh, restricted to how she sees him. We are grateful that she can still uh, communicate with him uh, over the phone and we pray that you would be near unto them all at this time. And we thank you for the steadfastness and for the endurance you've given to them. Heavenly Father, we also thank you that Jake and Joyce Bouquet are looking forward to celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary this coming Tuesday. We thank you for the many blessings that you bestowed upon them and their family. We thank you that they continue to be a shining light uh, for you and a witness for you uh, in their community. And we ask for uh, a rich blessing upon them that they, you, they would continue to flourish as a family that you'd be with them. Our Lord, our God, we thank you for the fact that Marlene Van Gerp is looking forward to celebrating her birthday this coming Saturday. May you continue to bless her with strength and with health, that you would be near unto her and Harry at this time, and that you would cause them to be a blessing. Our Lord, our God, we also pray for all the various missionaries who we are privileged to support. We particularly remember Reverend Bill and Aletha Green as they work in Costa Rica. We pray for them as they minister in this place, as this land, Costa Rica, has been affected tremendously by the repercussions of COVID-19, particularly the tourism industry. And as there are many changes affecting their society, which affects their church and the operation of their school, we pray that you would bless them, that you would be with their community at this time. Our Lord, our God, we again ask that you would help us to be diligent in praying for our missionaries, for our Bible translators, for our relief workers. We pray for those that are involved in medical services, for those in government. We desperately need your wisdom and your care. And so we commit ourselves and our lives unto you. And we pray that you be with us now in the rest of this time of worship as we listen in, as we sing, as we will hear you speak to us. Give us all that we need. We pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Our psalm of preparation is from the blue Psalter hymnal, number 42. Number 42, a setting of Psalm 24, E gates, lift up your heads. We'll sing all the stanzas of E gates, lift up your heads. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 8 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. We thank the Lord for his word, how it gives us light and life. And so as we open God's word and we'll hear it preached, let us now come before our God in a prayer for illumination. Prayer for illum illumination. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us without your word and your voice, your will and your way 
for us. And we pray that you'd be with us now as we will read from Psalm 24 and as we will study it together, that you would give us the illumination of the Holy Spirit, that you would give us insight and guidance. So help us in our teaching, help us in our listening, so that we may even more dedicate and commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name alone, amen. Our scripture reading for this morning for Psalm for Psalm, uh, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, is Psalm 24. Psalm 24, I, I invite you to turn to Psalm 24 in your Bibles at home. And we're going to be making a connection between Psalm 24 and Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. The song title here is The King of Glory and His Kingdom. This is the Psalm of David. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. This is good news. This is God's word. Well, last Lord's Day, our dear congregation, loved by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, last Lord's Day, we studied Psalm 42, Psalm 42, as we thought together about what it means to put our hope in God in this time of isolation. And now we have the inverse of Psalm 42, the inverse of it in terms of numbers. We'll be looking at Psalm 24, Psalm 24. And I'd like to give some credit to some fine work done by Dr. Philip Riken. Dr. Riken is the current president at Wheaton College. He previously was the preaching pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. And he has done some fantastic exegesis on this psalm and has provided some great insights, particularly some insights on the historical background. He's done this in a project entitled The Hope of Holy Week. So I'm grateful for his fine scholarship. And as we look at Psalm 24, we want to see the overall summary theme. And the overall theme here in Psalm 24 is that we celebrate that the King of Glory is also our loving Savior. That the King of Glory is also our loving Savior. And the question for you this morning is, are you ready for this King? Have you given your life to this King? Now here, the historical situation, this was a Psalm of David penned by him, is that the David describes the Lord's glorious entrance into the holy city of Jerusalem. Now, we can't be exactly certain of the historical background of the writing of the psalm, but a good educated guess is the situation that is given to us in 2 Samuel 6. In 2 Samuel 6, we read of the procession of bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Remember what the Ark of the Covenant was. It was that sacred golden chest that represented, that symbolized God's presence with his people. It had been made in the days of Moses. We can read about this in Exodus 25, 10 to 22. So remember that the ark was the visible sign and symbol of God's presence with his people. So now the ark is coming to Jerusalem, meaning God is coming to Jerusalem. So this Psalm, Psalm 24, is an anthem for the royal entrance of God coming into the holy city. Now, as we read Psalm 24, and as we think about the scene of the triumphal entry of Palm Sunday, we see a lot of similarities. These two scenes look and sound very similar. Remember what happened on Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. Thousands of pilgrims have come from northern Galilee and southern Judea to see this man with their own eyes, this man who has been reported to raise the dead. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. Remember that just a few days previously, he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. 
Now, in your imagination, you can hear the noise of the crowd, the, the cheering and the shouting. The king is coming. The king is coming. There's a tremendous amount of excitement and exuberance and exhilaration. Some people are tearing off their coats and they're throwing them on the road. Others are scrambling up trees and pulling down the branches. The children are lining the city streets, waving their victory branches and singing. And they're quoting from Psalm 118. Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And they finally see this king as he's coming over the crescent of the hill. And he's a man and he's riding not a stallion, not a war horse, but a donkey. A donkey, a symbol of royal authority and also a symbol of peace. And the crowds are asking each other in their enthusiasm, who is this? Who is this? And they're answering, saying to one another, as it says in Matthew 21, this is the prophet Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the scene of the first Palm Sunday. Jesus enters Jerusalem gentle and riding on a donkey. But something else happened that day as well. While Jesus was making his triumphal entry, the priests were praising God at the temple. It was the first day of the week, and according to ancient rabbis, the priests were reciting Psalm 24. This psalm, Lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. So, in the, peop the people in the streets and the priests of the temple were asking the same question. Who is this King? The people said it was Jesus. The priests said it was the Lord Almighty. And in a way that nobody yet could fully understand, they were both right. Because Jesus is the Lord Almighty. Jesus is the King of glory. And this is what Psalm 24 celebrates. The sovereignty, the holiness, the glory of King Jesus. Now as we look at this psalm, Psalm 24, we can see that it is neatly divided in three stanzas. It's neatly divided in your own Bibles. Stanzas one, verses one to two, stanza one. Verses three to six, stanza two. And verses seven to 10, stanza three. And we might label these stanzas this way. Stanza one, verses one to two, the sovereignty of the king. He's the true God and sovereign. The second stanza, the holiness of the king. The true worship that he is worthy of, demanding the holiness of his people. And thirdly, the triumph of the king. He is the conquering monarch. Again, we're asking the question, are you ready for this king? We could put it in this way, label these stanzas this way. How big he is, verses 1 to 2. How holy he is, verses 3 to 6. And how mighty he is, verses 7 to 10. So, Children, can you remember that? How big he is, verses 1 to 2. How holy he is, verses 3 to 6. How mighty he is, verses 7 to 10. Well, let's look at each one of these stanzas in order. Let's look at, first of all, how big the king is, how sovereign he is. And as we get there, let's just look for a few moments the context of Psalm 24 in the movement of the entire Psalter. Psalm 24 is after Psalm 23, which is after Psalm 22. This is significant. Psalm 22 is that famous Messianic Psalm that details the crucifixion of the Messiah. He is the suffering servant. And Jesus took many of these words of Psalm 22 upon his own lips on the cross. Psalm 23, the well-known beloved Psalm, he is the good shepherd. He is the great shepherd who lays his life down for his sheep. And now Psalm 24, he is the victorious, he's the triumphant king. So verses seven to 10, this last stanza is the prophetic reference to the triumphant return in the future of this king. So that's a bit of the context of Psalm 24 in light of the whole Psalter. Now let's look at the fact our, uh, that he is the creator, how big this king is. Verse one, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. 
One translation puts it this way, God claims the earth and everything in it. God claims the world and all who live in it. He built it on the ocean foundations. He laid it out on the river girders. He has founded it upon the seas, established upon the waters. It all belongs to him. That's the theme here, is that everything and everyone belongs to God. He is the maker of everything, and therefore he's the monarch. He's the king over everything. And why? Well, because he created it. And what's all included here? Like, well, look at verse 1. The world and those who dwell therein, all its fullness. So the fruitful earth, he fills it, all its fullness. The people who dwell therein. And then the ver uh, verse 2 speaks about how he maintains it. He is founded upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So understand, this not only includes the world itself, but everything in it. The mountains and valleys, the hills and plains, the rocks and trees, the lions and llamas, all the birds and bumblebees, he has created everything. All the people too. Even this translation, it's, uh, uh, it could be translated as the world, the peopled world. So all the people who live in the world, they belong to God as well which means that he claims authority over everyone who lives in this world. Now, on what basis does God claim this absolute authority? Well, it's on the basis of creation. The earth belongs to the Lord because he, what's it say? He made it. He founded and established it. So God is the creator, and because he is the creator, he is also the king. So God's power in creation gives him the right to rule over everything that he has made. And we think of that great quote from the Dutch theologian Abram Kuyper. He said, in the total expanse of the human life, there is not one single square inch of which Christ, who alone is sovereign, does not declare mine. God says, I've created it, I have found it, I have established it. It all belongs to me. This world belongs to God. There's a, a popular and, and a very good quality news magazine, Christian news magazine in the United States called World Magazine. And it finds its title and its motto from this psalm, the world and everything in it. So this is God's world. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a tremendous comfort to us, especially as we find ourselves in the middle of a world pandemic. There is still order in this world because it is God's world. He is still upholding and sustaining this world by the word of his power. As we love to sing, this is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. So he established it and that means he maintains it which means that this world still has a sense of stability and steadiness. This is why we can do science and math and biology and geometry, that there are certain rules which govern this world. You throw a ball up, you know it's going to come down. At the rate it always comes down, the force of gravity. And this is significant for us today. Because the doctrine of creation, as we think about it, it does not merely refer to a, a past cosmic event. It is a present reality. And it's not morally neutral as well. As one person had said, has, has put it well, order and chaos find their counterpart in the forces of good and evil which shape our lives. Which simply means that this ordering of God, our God is a God of order, should shape our lives. You know, we don't do well in chaos. We don't do well when, when things are just completely out of control. But our God is a God of, of order, and so we can trust him for that. Now, the world might appear to be in chaos right now, and there is a tremendous amount of anxiety and fear in our world right now. But we need to remember that our world belongs to God, and the whole world is in his hands. And even as we think about all the reports that we're getting from medical professionals and doctors, and we're thankful 
for the abilities, the skill, the insight that God gives them, that there is still a general predictability that with this virus, scientists have been able to predict how it's going to react, how it's going to affect different populations. And because of these predictions, because of science, because our God is a God of order and stability, that we can prepare for this virus. And these preparations, these precautions are saving lives. That most likely they will be able to make a vaccine. They're working on it very, very hard. And the reason they can do this is because of the symmetry and steadiness of God's world. This is all the earth because it belongs to him. Now this keeps us from going crazy in fear. This keeps us, keeps our hearts steady and calm. I submit to you that I would wake up terrified every morning if I didn't believe that this was God's world, that he had everything in control and that even this virus is under his control. So the basis of life is that he is the creator. We need to remind ourselves of how big God is. Now, if God is this big, if he's the maker and monarch of everything, if everything belongs to him, if there are no mo mo maverick molecules, if there's no out of control atoms, if everything is being held together by the word of his power, then how should we respond? Well, we should call him king. We should give him our life allegiance. But how do we do that? See, this is the, the question that the second stanza of Psalm 24 asks and answers. Who can stand before such a mighty God? A holy God, as Psalm 24 will teach us. Who has permission to enter the royal court to have audience with the king of kings? Well, the demands of this king follow naturally with searching questions being asked of those who come in the presence of the king. And so this is our second point, the second stanza, how holy our God is and why we should worship him and how we can worship him. So how holy he is. Let's look at verse three. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. So who can come into the presence of God? Who can stand in his holy place? How does the psalmist answer? Those who have clean hands and those who have a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falseness. Only the clean-hearted, clean-handed, sorry, only the clean-handed, only the pure-hearted. Men who won't cheat, women who won't seduce, one translator says. Clean hands. Now, there's a lot of talk about clean hands these days. Make sure your hands are clean, wash them well, and understand that the psalmist isn't just referring to having clean hands and having good hand sanitizer around. It's referring to right actions. It's the word picture. Who can be in the audience of the king? Only those who have clean hands. It's an outward obedience, right actions. And also those who have inward integrity, pure heart. This is having a right motive, being a person without guile, a person who has perfect integrity, who is seeking to have a clear conscience. Understand what the psalmist is giving us here is a picture of repentance. Boys and girls, remember what repentance is, right? It's getting off the wrong road, the wrong road of sin, the wrong road of living for oneself, thinking that we're the boss, thinking that we are the master of our own life, getting off that wrong road and making a big U-turn, a 180, and getting on the right road, which is living for the Lord and seeking to live by his laws and by his precepts. And so the psalmist is calling here for repentance. Get off the wrong road, get on the right road. But repentance is acknowledging our own sin, isn't it? That's why we had this call of confession. The psalmist says, I am a man who is full of iniquity. But think of what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter six, the prophet, as he has a living encounter with the holiness of God, a, a thrice holy God, holy, holy, holy God. What does he say? Woe is me, 
For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He beholds the sheer holiness of his God, and he says, I am undone. But he asks the Lord to cleanse him and to purify him, and the Lord does that by holding a, a live coal to his lips, a symbol of cleansing. So the picture here is of a, of a man or woman, boy or girl, that desires repentance and cleansing. And what else does it say here? He has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. Psalmus is addressing the sin of idolatry here. A person who knows his idols and rejects them. That is the person being described here. Remember how the first commandment starts. You shall have no other gods besides me. No other gods. And the reality is, is that these false gods that we might worship, these dead gods, they're simply that. They're dead. They're empty. They're hollow. They can't do anything for us. And so we might give our energy to them, but they leave us running on empty. And so we need to repent of our idols. We need to recognize what our idols are. We need to repent of them. And then we need to turn to the living God and rejoice in him as the fount of life and life. So understand that all of life is repentance. John Calvin says this in his commentary on clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and pure hearts comprehend all religion and denote a well-ordered life. Clean hands and a pure heart. Now verse six, what does verse six say? It says, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Now this word generation literally means circle of folk held together by common factors. Now what is the common factor being described here? Is that this is the generation, the common folk, the circle of folk, they together seek Yahweh and find him to be the saving God. These are the God seekers. These are the God questers. They're seeking after God's face. And this is a beautiful word here, the face, who seek your face. The Hebrew word is panim. It means God's presence. As we hear in God's benediction, his blessing to us from number six, may his countenance, his face be upon you. Understand, brothers and sisters, dear beloved, the greatest treasure that God can give us is himself his face, the smile of his countenance. And this is the blessing for those who seek God. He gives him, her, his face, his presence. Even Jacob, it says, this is Jacob. Or other, another translation is, or like Jacob. Now, as we think about this reference to Jacob, we might be a little bit puzzled and perplexed. As we read the story of Jacob, he was not, a model guy by any stretch of the imagination. As his name suggests, his name Jacob means twister, deceiver, cheater, and Jacob lived up to his name. But one thing Jacob was good at, and he is an example on this point, he knew how to hold on to God for dear life. He knew how to hold on to God for dear life. Remember when he's wrestling with God, the manifestation of God at Peniel, through the, the morning hours. What does he say? I will not let you go unless you bless me. He is fighting, he's wrestling with Yahweh, and he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I cannot take another step in my life without your blessing, without your sufficient strength. And so Jacob is holding on to the Lord in desperation. I need you. And that's where Jacob is a good example. He's holding on to God in desperation. I need thee every hour. I have nowhere else to turn. You are my all in all. And this is the faith. This is the surrender, the allegiance that the Lord honors and blesses. And that's what Psalm 24 teaches because the verse five says, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Blessing from the Lord. One commentator has said this, a life which will express in outward actions the inner motivation which controls the will and the conscience and an inner motivation which is rooted in total allegiance to God. So there are outward actions, but there's an inner motivation which is controlling the will and conscience and this inner motivation at heart is allegiance, complete surrender to the Lord of hosts. Now there is a blessing, there's a gift. 
connected with this. Look at verse 5, 5b. And righteousness from the God of his salvation. Righteousness, the Hebrew word is zedek. From the God of his salvation he will receive. Now, it's a little, little obscure, the language here of, of the Hebrew, but we can explain it this way. That the blessing here is to receive this righteousness from God, the God of our salvation. They may ascend the holy place, these pilgrims, these worshipers, and stand in the presence of God. But understand, nobody can come in the presence of God in and of themselves. Not because of any inherent goodness or righteousness. No, we can't stand in the presence of God. It's only in a spiritual union with this God, in one who fulfills the standard of righteousness, that we can stand in the presence of such a holy and holy God. Understand that this was one of the key components that led to the Reformation of the 16th century. And this Psalm, Psalm 24, is very similar to Psalm 15. There's similar language, who can ascend the hill of the Lord, who can come in his perfect presence. And the, the reformers were asking this question, essentially, how can sinning sinners, like you and me, come into the presence of a non-sinning God? How can sinning sinners come into the presence of a non-sinning holy God, a thrice holy God, and not die? And not drop dead? How does a holy, holy, holy God save sinners like you and me? Well, the Reformers, as they studied the Bibles, studied their Bibles, said, it's not that a righteousness that is, but it is a righteousness that God gives. Not a righteousness that is, but rather a righteousness that God gives. To particularly Martin Luther, as he looked at his own heart and soul, he realized he didn't have this righteousness. He had a very legal mind. He had a very guilt-stricken conscience. And so he realized he could not measure up to God's standard, no matter how hard he desperately tried. But when he realized that it is the just that they will live by faith, as they look to Jesus, and as they look to Jesus in faith, that through the means of faith, Jesus perfect righteousness comes imputed, transferred to his account, then he realized that's how I might be made whole. That's how I, as a sinner, can come into the presence of a holy God. So this is the gospel. This is the gospel of grace, that Jesus does for us what we can't do for ourselves. To understand, dear beloved, all of us flunk Psalm 24. We read Psalm 24, clean hands, pure heart. No, we fail badly. And this is why we need Jesus. This is why we need to put our faith in him. Understand that Jesus is the man of Psalm 24. He is the man of pure hands, clean hands. He's the man of pure heart. He is the man who was never deceitful. He, he was never false, that he always worshiped the, his father in heaven. So he has fulfilled for us this perfect righteousness. He was made under the law, but never broke the law. He loved God the Father perfectly. He loved his fellow man perfectly. This is this righteousness, this righteousness that we desperately need. And it's in a living relationship with him that this, relationship, this righteousness can become ours. Now, this righteousness of Jesus has qualified him to enter into the place and the presence of the sovereign God. And when we are united to Jesus in faith, he opens up the way into the Holy of Holies. Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Why can we be confident in the presence of God? Why can we come with boldness into his presence in prayer? It's because of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit works to purify us. This is the wonder of the Christian life. When Jesus is living inside of your heart, the Holy Spirit is residing in your, in your heart and he is transforming us so that we will slowly, imperfect, imperfectly, but we will begin to desire to have clean hands and a pure heart.
that he changes our hearts and our ideas and our minds. But the only way we come in the presence of this God is to be justified, to trust in Jesus as the only sacrifice for sin. So he is the all-holy God, all-holy God, but we can come into his presence through the merits of King Jesus. Charles Spurgeon wrote this, It is possible that you are saying, I shall never enter into the heaven of God, for I have neither clean hands nor a pure heart. Look then to Christ, who has already climbed the holy hill. He has entered as the forerunner of those who trust him, follow in his footsteps and repose upon his merit. He rides triumphantly into heaven, and you shall ride there too if you trust him. But how can I get the character described, you say? The Spirit of God will give that to you. He will create in you a new heart and a right spirit. Faith in Jesus is the work of the Holy Spirit, and it has all of the virtues wrapped up in it. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That is the prayer of a God-seeker, a God-quester. Now, as we examine the holiness of our God, we then think about those who can enter into his presence. And this last stanza speaks about the triumph of this king. The triumph of this king, he is the king of glory. Now as we think about this third stanza, verses 7 to 10, it sounds like that we are eavesdropping on a dialogue between people coming to worship and those on duty at the gates of the temple. And to understand what is happening here, we need to recall an old English tradition. According to ancient custom, when the king of England entered the city of London through the temple bar, a servant would herald his approach. And the herald would stand outside the city wall and demand entrance in the king's name, crying, open the gate. Then the royal party would hear the response from within, who is there? And then the herald would then answer, the king of England. And the gates would swing open and the king would enter the city. And the king would then receive a royal hearty welcome from all of his loyal subjects. That's kind of the tradition here. And this is where I particularly credit Phil Breichen for his this tremendous insight into the literary genre of the psalm. He says that this psalm is an antiphonal, a song with a call and a response. So in David's day, it would have been sung by choirs of Levites and perhaps also by some soloists. So it must have gone uh, something like this. First, the choir sang outside the city gates, calling on behalf of their triumphant king. They would sing, lift up your head, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. But Before the gates could be opened, the gatekeeper had to be certain of the king's royal identity. So hence, there's this demand. Who is this king of glory? And then the heralds replied, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. But by this time, the royal choir is starting to get impatient. So they repeat their summons. They're saying, lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. And now as the giant gates slowly swing open, the gatekeeper repeats his question. And it's not because he doesn't hear. It doesn't be, it's not because his hearing aid isn't on. And it's not because he's trying to be difficult. But because he wants to hear the happy, the joyful news again. Who is he, this king of glory? But, and together they're singing, the Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. The Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts, he is the king of glory, 24 verse 10. So follow the flow. Verse 7, it's the request of those who come seeking admission to the temple into the temple courts in the name of the king of glory. In verse eight, the gatekeepers pose this question and the worshipers respond and repeat the refrain in the rest of verses eight, eight to nine. And then the first line of verse 10, the gatekeeper's question is heard again. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Or another translation, who is this king glory? God of the angel armies, he is the king of glory. He's the Yahweh of hosts. And this phrase, Yahweh of hosts, King of glory, it's referring to the sufficiency of God. He compromises within himself every potential and every single power. This is what we have in King Jesus, particularly as we think about his exaltation on Easter Sunday, which we celebrate next Lord's Day. After Jesus' resurrection, he comes back from the battlefield in a victorious victory. 
And the psalm concludes with the response of the worshipers. Look at our hero. Look at our king of glory, our majestic, triumphant monarch. We praise and we worship him for who he is and what he has done. This is what glory means. He is the king of glory. What does glory mean? Well, it's connected actually to the Hebrew word kabod uh, for holy, which means to, which literally means weight. It's referring to the, the weight of God, his, his infinite weight his supreme importance, but also to his beauty. He is the one of perfection of inexpressible splendor and majesty. And so these worshipers are captured by the simple might of their king, and they are captured in the wonder and beauty of who he is, of his mercy and of his love. Now let's go back to the context of Palm Sunday. Remember, this excitement and exuberance of those that lined the streets in Jerusalem. They enter, Jesus, sorry, enters into Jerusalem triumphantly. Folks are very excited and happy. But what's going to happen in the next few days? Jesus knows what's going to happen. The people don't yet, though. He's going to undergo tremendous, tremendous suffering. He is going to be scorned. He is going to be tortured, beaten. And that's just the physical suffering. He's going to undergo God-forsakenness on the cross. He who knew no sin is going to become sin in the place of another. As the substitutionary lamb, as he will propitiate the wrath of God for the sins of his people, as he will take upon himself, absorb in himself God's just wrath, the penalty of sin for all of God's people. This is his work of atonement. And we call this his humiliation. We think of Jesus' humiliation beginning at his conception, and he continues to undergo humiliation, scorn, and suffering as he is finally abandoned by his father on the cross. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of Jesus' work. After his humiliation comes his exaltation. And this begins on Easter morning as he rises from the dead. It continues as he ascends to the Father and then he is seated at the Father's right hand. And as we think about all that happens on Passion Week and on Easter Sunday and his ascension and then also his session, understand that this is one redemptive event. His death and resurrection is one redemptive event. which simply means that he does and he will triumph over death. And we know that. This is what's great about being this side of the cross. We can look back in history. So in the words of one commentator, he says this. These verses, these verses, these verses picture the scene. When after spoiling the powers of darkness, after abolishing death itself, the resurrected God-man, the Lord, returns to heaven in triumph. And as he approaches the heavenly portals, the celestial herald cries out, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and lift them up, your everlasting doors, and the King of glory will come in. And the angelic watchers within ask, Who is this King of glory? They answer, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is the King of glory. And this is what we believe. He is the King of glory. He is the hero. And on the cross and in the grave, Jesus had done battle. He went face to face with sin, death, and Satan. And he defeated them. He broke the stranglehold of sin. And he gained victory over all the powers of hell and over all the forces of evil. As it says in Colossians 2 verse 15, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Because Jesus is this victorious warrior king, the Lord of hosts, he has the right to enter into the heavenly city as the king of glory. He is the true king. And he passes through the gates of splendor. You know, when a dear loved one dies, one who is in the Lord, who is a Christian, we say they pass into glory. They were promoted into glory. The only reason that they can be promoted to glory, that they can pass away into glory, is because Jesus has passed into glory first as their substitute. And it's because they have a union with him through faith that they're united to his perfect life atoning death, powerful resurrection, and exaltation. That's the only reason that we can look forward to glory. So this is the picture of this triumphant king. Now finally, conclusion. 
The psalm ends where it began. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. There's a celebration of God's majestic power, of his of the fact that he is the maker and monarch, the earth is the Lord's and all is fullness. And yet this awesome, all-powerful God comes into his temple home, not in thunder or in lightning bolt, but in the midst of his worshiping people who acknowledge the demands he makes upon them and celebrate his presence among them. That's a quote from a commentator. So what's it mean to glorify God? What's it mean to make much of him? to sing, to shout, he is the king of glory. Well, it means to obey him unconditionally, to give him our will and our heart, and to find in him supreme beauty and excellence. The psalm speaks of the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant coming into the city, making entrance. Jesus makes entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But there's another place for Jesus to make his royal entry, for God to make his entrance. And that's into your very own heart. Make entrance to him in your heart. Enthrone him. Crown him with many crowns. Surrender and submit your life to this wonderful, majestic King of glory. That you may sing this song with God's people, with the Israelites of old. He is the King of glory. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word from Psalm 24 that you are the King of glory. You are the Yahweh of hosts. That you are the triumphant, majestic King. We thank you that you have made a way that sinful people like us can come into your presence. We acknowledge that we do not have clean hands. We do not have pure hearts. We acknowledge that we are idolaters. But we thank you that Jesus had clean hands, and a pure heart, that he was never false, he was never deceitful, and that in him, in a living faith with him, his righteousness can be imputed, credited to us. And then, therefore, we can come with boldness into your presence. So help us to be a worshiping people. Help us to be a thankful people. Help us to be a people that marvels at your creative handiwork. And so we thank you that you are our Savior and our God. In Jesus' name alone, amen. Let's now sing our song of response, our hymn of response, number 375, 375, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. We'll sing all the stanzas of All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
We now have the opportunity to worship the Lord in the giving of his, tithe and our, his tithes and our offerings. Galatians 6 says this, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. As the deacons cannot come forward and collect your offerings this morning, we do uh, ask you as a, as a church leadership to continue to lay aside uh, gifts for the Lord and for his church and for his kingdom. And let us now just spend a time in, in prayer and just silent reflection as we think about how we live as living sacrifices unto our God. Let's pray. Our great King, we have studied Psalm 24, which announces that the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. And we acknowledge that we belong to you and that everything we have, everything that we are, is yours. So help us to understand this properly and to appropriately appropriate it help us to be good stewards and we give our lives as living sacrifices to you help us to commit our time and our treasure and our talents to your kingship and to your lordship and so as we have a few moments of silent meditation help us to better consecrate ourselves to you more fully and completely Pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Let us now sing our final anthem of praise, our doxology, number 568. 568. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Jude 1, 24 to 25 says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Let's ask for the Lord's final blessing in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise of your peace and of your presence. We pray that you would go with us from this place, that you would give us grace, mercy, and peace in abundance. In Jesus' name alone, amen.